Hi, everyone. Welcome to VR AR Bytes podcast, our weekly show featuring the movers and shakers from the Central Florida chapter. Today, my guest is Dr. Doug Maxwell, who's the Chief Architect and Science Advisor for the U.S. Army Futures Command Common Synthetic Training Environment Cross-Functional Team, otherwise known by the acronym STE-CFT. Now, Doug's got over 20 years of experience in the modeling and simulation industry. He started his career in 1999 as a researcher for the U.S. Navy and moved over to the U.S. Army ecosystem in 2010, where he's been focused on finding ways to improve human performance through the use of virtual and synthetic training tools. And one of the things that I think makes Doug unique is that he has a strong academic background in the areas of modeling and simulation, as evidenced by his degrees and patents, but his real passion is putting the technology to work and solving real world problems. Now, this is one of the reasons that he was asked by the Army to play such an important role in the development of the common synthetic training environment. So, Doug, welcome to VRAR Bytes. Thank you for having me. Hey, well, to get started, uh, I need to disclose that I am a contractor and these opinions are my own and do not reflect uh, official guidance from the U.S. Army or the U.S. government. So um, can you tell us a bit more about what the CFT is and your role there? Sure. Um, when the Army decided to stand up their new Futures Command a few years ago, uh, the CFTs are, are a new construct. They uh, can be thought of as customer advocates. So they serve as uh, requirements stakeholders and capability documentation developers for uh, the functional areas that they are resp responsible for. And uh, so we are the STE, the, the synthetic training environment, and we are looking at the training needs of the Army uh, for the next couple of decades. Well, wow. that uh, sounds like a very exciting and important you know, function that you guys have. It's very stimulating, yes. <laughs> so can you, you know, considering that our audience is primarily focused on XR technology, can, can you elaborate on how XR technology is going to be relevant in the next generation of simulation and training for the U.S. Army? Sure. Um, well, in my role, we, we do a lot of prototyping and a lot of market research. So it's not just, you know, an academic exercise where we, we draft from doctrine, you know, our needs. Um, I'm a big fan of the technology, for one thing, and I love to see the advances that are made in uh, the presentation layers, uh, you know, the, the new higher resolutions, the wider, you know, field of views, you know, the, the, the interfaces, the tracking, that's all great stuff. And having a good working knowledge of, of this allows us to pair the technical capabilities of the available products to, uh, to training. And so I wanted to, you know, make sure that we don't downplay that. But what I really think that will make um, XR technology relevant um, is we need to think beyond graphics. We need to think beyond the, the presentation layer and really think about this technology as a knowledge acquisition enabler. Okay. So um, it, it's nice to have a really advanced piece of tech, but it needs to fit into a curriculum. It needs to fit into a pedagogy. It needs to you know, find its way into the training in such a way that a return on the investment can be, can be established. And I think the human sciences, the human engineering part of this has been ne neglected largely until now. And um, that's, that's not to put down the industry. It's just to say that it was up until now but the hard technical challenges had not been solved. And so now it's time to think about how to integrate. So what I would like to see, um, speaking from an infantry training context, by the way, um, the, the flight simulators, the vehicle simulators, and the park task trainers, you know, they kind of had it easy, you know, from an implementation standpoint, because it's straightforward to be able to tell, you know, when someone is doing a, a good job or demonstrating knowledge. But in the, in the infantry side of the house, you know, we're a lot more open-ended in our operating environment. And um, so you can't approach infantry training like you do a flight simulator. Right. Um, what I would like to see is uh, ultimately simulation for the infantry used not just as practical exercises or for knowledge checks, you know, during the, the course of training in their period of instruction. But what I would really like to see is the simulation used as their final exam so that 
people are demonstrating knowledge, you know, from say battle drills or, or, you know, whatever kind of reaction to contact, you know, you would give say infantry, their ability to understand what's happening to them and then respond correctly. And then demonstrating that response in simulation is really what I would like to see rather than a paper test uh, for them to be able to demonstrate that they understand what's, what's happening to them. Absolutely. So, so would you then agree that the IVAS is probably the, the, the first real technology that will enable that sort of assessment in the field? That's the hope. That, that really is the hope. And that's, you know, leaning into the, the live training, vice um, virtual training um, argument. But yes, the, the short answer is yes. You know, we've done really good work. The Hunter systems in the past, you know, were used operationally. I think uh, IVAS is going to enjoy a lot of success operationally. And right now we're looking at how to use it, you know, from a, from a training context. Yeah, I mean, over the last, you know, while, in the last few interviews that I've done, I think I, I mentioned one of them that I think when we look back in history and we see what was that real inflection point of when XR technology was like, you know, no kidding, this is real. And I, and I think it was when the Army awarded Microsoft that IVAS contract because it really put a serious stake in the ground in the Army's confidence in that, that XR could deliver what they were looking for. Well, I'm hoping that establishing, again, a return on the investment really helps us get beyond, you know, a, a hype cycle wave yeah. and gets us into a sustainment and maintainability um, stance so that, you know, we, we begin incorporating this technology as a normal course of our period of instruction. Um, I, I don't want the enthusiasm and the successes that we're making right now, you know, to somehow fizzle out. And so we're, we're doing a lot of work to try to make sure that the technology's value is realized in the training. And, and I, you know, I know I'll speak on behalf of the entire industry, you know, and we're anxiously awaiting the results of those and, and, and you know, the lessons that you've learned and the actual ROI. So mm -hmm. that, is that something you think the Army is going to openly share? I don't, I don't see why not. In fact, you'll see probably it, it reflected in, in solicitations. I see a phased introduction of the technology into, um, into the training. Um, and we can talk about, about that yeah. a little later. I'd like to first talk about the Kobayashi Maru. I, I hear that, um, that metaphor used quite a bit, and I'm probably going to upset the Star Trek fans a little bit, but I don't think that metaphor is, is quite appropriate in, in this stance, you know, or the, the holodeck. But, you know, specifically the Kobayashi Maru was a test to see how someone um, handles a no-win situation. Okay. And, you know, it, it boxes, you know, the user in to, to, to deal with, you know, a combat situation where there's, you know, no way to win. And I want to do the exact opposite. I want to use this technology to promote critical thinking skills um, at the lowest echelons, by the way. Um, to give people an opportunity to um, tackle hard problems, to develop decision-making skills. Um, instead of setting them up to fail with a no-win situation, you know, what I'd like to do is set them up for success with an open-ended, uh, non-deterministic simulation um, that represents an operating environment that's realistic and allows for creativity in their decision-making. Um, I want the trainees to come out of the training feeling like they just went through a real battle, but also understanding that they may have learned something or demonstrated that they had knowledge that was critical to their, their success. And uh, so I don't want the simulation to beat them up. I, I want the simulation to enable them to demonstrate that they understand what's going on. So it sounds like... AI and machine learning is going to be an important element of gauging that. It will. You know, in our current work, you know, we're examining the, the training management workflow, you know, through plan, prepare, you know, execute and assess. And then I always tack on plus readiness assessment on the end. Um, during the examination of this training management workflow, we are identifying key areas where automation or automated decision making 
uh, would be an enabler technology to the training management um, who is, is, is going to use this in, in the classroom. And so um, by, by collecting or surveilling the knowledge demonstration data, the performance data coming out of the, the systems, um, I'd like to see predictions made that will make the system more efficient. So for example, if someone is consistently demonstrating they don't understand a concept, automatically initiate like an intelligent tutor or um, pull them out so that they can get more remediation so that they're not wasting time. And conversely, if someone is a superstar and this is too easy of a, of a scenario, then identify that unit or individual and then move them on to something more advanced. You know, don't waste their time, you know, with more simulation, it's too easy for them. Okay. All right. So now I'm going to switch to our five and five, which is five questions in five minutes. So the first question, Doug, what's the most interesting project that you've seen or worked on that uses XR technology? So back in uh, 2000 and 2001, I was with the, uh, the Naval Research Lab and we uh, were doing a lot of work for the Marine War Fighting Lab. And I worked on a project with Dr. Rob King at the time that we called Put That There, PTT. And again, keep in mind, this was 20, 21 years ago, but uh, we integrated gestural interfaces with natural language processing and virtual reality in a cave um, to create a battle space visualization planning tool. So what you had was a, what the user saw was the topology of a battlefield. And there were icons following the, the mill standard 2525 uh, iconography. And using a wand, you could point to the unit uh, that you wanted to address and tell the system, put that unit and then point to another location and say there, and the unit would, would move. And so um, 20 years ago, uh, we had um, uh, Silicon Graphics, uh, Onyx 2 supercomputer that was running the, the cave part. We were using uh, Dragon naturally speaking on a PC connected by a network to do the natural language processing. And we were using uh, Linux to control the, um, the user devices that we custom made, by the way. There weren't any available. We had to build them. And um, so it was an, an incredibly ambitious integration task. It worked. So we were able to show that you could tell a system to move units if you wanted to. And, uh, and again, we're talking 20 years ago. And uh, still, that was one of the most um, technically ambitious and, and creative uses of the technology that I've, I've seen. And I would love to see it uh, again today. Cool. What do you think the biggest challenges are facing broad scale adoption of XR? A uh, lack of ROI. Is so, it lack of, lack of ROI or lack of demonstrated ROI? Lack of ROI. Um, okay. So <clears throat> I think of a return on investment on, on three main dimensions. There are a lot more, but I, I can strain it to three. It's uh, performance, time, and then obviously money. Okay. And so um, I'd like to see industry get really creative and help with trying to establish for the customer or the government um, how to understand the return on investment, not just for XR, but for simulation-based training, specifically right. in the infantry um, in general. Um, unfortunately, I hate to say it, but I think funding would probably be the most important factor. And in my world, it would be performance, but for the decision makers and, um, and for the acquisition community, you know, uh, funding would probably be uh, one to look at. Um, but we need to know. We, we, we simply don't know right now that a soldier benefits from exposure to uh, XR in the, in the infantry um, by how much. Um, and that has to do partly with the way that we do assessments, you know, the go-no-go -no -go assessments, um, and partly with the difficulty it is in getting that data out of the system. So, you know, we're, we're starting to see and by the way, a few years ago, that was the same, that was exactly the same thing on the non-government space. Mm. But over the past couple of years, with more and more companies releasing their ROI, 
like uh, like I guess Walmart with their new employee training, for example, right? There's now clear, solid evidence in the commercial sector. So what you're saying is we need to do the same thing on the government sector. Yes. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. And that, that industry has a role to play in that by maybe leveraging the experience they've got in similar areas and bringing that over and helping right. the government. Okay, gotcha. Right. Okay. Uh, now, who in the VR AR community inspires you or who do you follow to find out what's happening? Yeah, you know, there's a lot of giants out there. Um, uh, well, the VR lab alumni at uh, the Naval Research Lab were, were tremendous enablers. Um, people like Dennis Brown, um, Simon Julier, uh, Mark Livingston. Uh, I, I still like to see what they're up to occasionally. Uh, I also look at the, the funders, you know, the, the thought leaders inside of government who are creating opportunities like SBIRs or BAA topics. Uh, folks like Susan Harkrider and Peter Squire, uh, they, they do a really good job of kind of staying ahead of the curve uh, and trying to anticipate what um, the, the needs of the soldiers or the warfighters are going to be. Okay. I also like to look at companies like uh, Microsoft and Magic Leap. I mean, they're, they're doing some really interesting work, specifically in, in UI, uh, the presentation layer. Um, but I would really like to see a tighter coupling of industry and government, you know, to make sure that we're not just getting interesting tools, but figuring out how to maximize the application of those tools in the effectiveness of people's uh, knowledge acquisition and demonstration of knowledge. Um, and then you've also got the companies um, who like uh, Sortec or Design Interactive and Aptima. You know, their experts are doing the research you know, that people like Susan and, and Peter are funding. And uh, so the results from that research are, are actually critical to um, to keep an eye on. So there's a, there's a lot going on out there. Um, I am often humbled by, by the demonstrations and the work that I see in the S&T community. And another function really of the, uh, the CFT is also technology transition. So we try to pull that research, we try to pull that tech into our uh, technical integration facility, prototype with it, and then produce uh, either information or prototypes that can then go on to be you know, assessed by users, uh, the user community. Roger, Roger. Okay. All right. Last question. What would you like to see yeah. from the VR AR Association? You know, the low hanging fruit there for that answer would be standards. I'd like to see, you know, a common set of standards for learning management. Um, we, we take each of the devices that we examine pretty much on a case by case basis. You know, you've got, you know, a, a published set of APIs that would allow you to integrate their device into say, Unity or, or Unreal, for example. Um, what we don't have, you know, is something beyond, here's our device, now you go figure out how to use it. Um, what I would like to see is, a, again, a tighter coupling between industry and government so that whenever a device comes along, um, we're not just left up to the government's um, imagination, if you will, on how to use it. Right. Um, the, the demonstrations need to be more contextually relevant. Um, so a seamless interoperation between the learning record stores, for example, or the learning management systems um, would, would be very, very, very helpful. Um, that integration left up to a third party integrator um, is expensive and may not get us what what we what we want. Um, the demonstrations, you know, I'd, I'd like to see more more relevant demonstrations. So we're synthetic training. So showing us a um, a Call of Duty style scenario is a, a, it only shows us how good your presentation layer is. It doesn't tell us how good you are at at getting data out of the system to demonstrate the person operating your equipment is uh, demonstrating knowledge. Um, so we're, we're looking at a bit of an attitude change. Um, yeah. you're, you're not just selling us units of devices. You, I'd like to see partnerships in helping us to establish how to use your device in our training system of systems. Gotcha. Okay, well, look, that was uh, super informative. I'm sure that our audience is gonna have lots of questions 
Um, and so I will post this out onto LinkedIn and um, I'm sure folks will be connecting with you. So thank you very much for, for joining us today, Doug. I appreciate it. Thank you.